Well, hey there. Welcome into another episode of The Winsome Creationist. I'm joined again by my friend, Dr. Phil Dennis. And this time around, uh, what we'd like to do, if you've watched the past couple videos in our series, we've been talking through um, one of the most common answers and responses to the distant starlight problem um, as it's as it's well known for young age creationists and so we have galaxies and planets and stars that um, are a long way away and uh, there's issues with that reconciling that with the idea of a six to th uh, six to ten roughly thousand year old universe and so how do we get the light from the stars to the earth. That's sort of the central question. And so we've talked a little bit about Jason Lyle's anisotropic synchrony convention. We've talked about sort of a um, proposed enhancement on the ASC model called the CTC model with creation time coordinates. And we're eventually going to get to Phil's model in this series, which is a general relativity based model um, as opposed to special relativity. But before we get there, we had some comments and some questions come in on the past two episodes, and we wanted to take some time to um, look at some of those and kind of hopefully dispel some misunderstandings and provide some further clarification where needed. So um, I'm excited to do this, Bill, and uh, excited to have you here. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to start by kind of going into the idea of conventionality. That's where we're going to start. There's a lot of confusion, it seems, around whether or not you can just change some coordinates and that has an objective difference on the reality of the distance between two objects. And so I think that's where we want to start, Phil. So I'll let you take it away whenever you're ready, sir. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Steve. Uh, one of the, as you said, one of the common uh, supports or what they think is a logical support for the ASC is the conventionality of uh, units of measurement. And they want to say that ASC is like units of measurement. Uh, I don't believe that analogy holds any water. And what I'm going to illustrate here is the distinction between what we will call a standard and conventional units. Uh, the, the main point I'm going to make is that once you've established a standard, you don't change the standard. You can label the standard with different units of measurement, but by comparing different weights with the standard, you can determine the arithmetic to compute, for example, kilograms to pounds, right? So for example, mm. say we have a standard weight. And the thing I wanna point out is when you establish a standard weight, you're not required to use one of this size. You could use any size, right? Uh, so that's convent, that's the conventionality of that. But once you've established that as a standard, as the unit of measure or whatever you want to say, you don't change the standard. And so to the right here, I show that, uh, if this were a one kilogram weight, you can label it one kilogram, but we know one kilogram is the same as 2.2 pounds. And if the conventionality support that the ASC advocates like to appeal to uh, were true, well, you're not changing anything, right? This is one right. kilogram and I change units and it's 2.2 pounds. So by changing units, you, you, you're not changing anything. So the point is I have the same underlying objective reality and no change in weight. Now, somebody could say, well, let's uh, just say this is no longer one kilogram. Let's say it's two kilograms. Well, you've just relabeled the standard by another unit, right? Uh, right. That that wouldn't, yeah, once you've established it as a standard and claims it's one kilogram, you better not cross it off and put two, two, two kilograms on it, right? Right. Uh, so you can't yeah. change units, right? So that would be, that would be a bogus argument. So that, that's the whole point. The, the conventionality of units does not support the ASC, uh, uh, thesis. And so to apply this to, you know, to the, to the starlight issue in, in particular, you know, th this, correct me if I'm wrong, or, or what I'm really asking is for you to clarify this. Um, you know, you're referring to the fact that, okay, well, we can choose, says Dr. Lyle, between the Einstein synchrony convention and the anisotropic uh, synchrony convention, uh, we can choose 
because he says that there's no way to objectively determine the one way speed of light. And so we actually know from our previous discussions that there's, there actually does seem to be ways to objectively determine the one way speed of light, but he's saying that there's not. And if there's not, then we just get to choose which synchrony convention we use. And God chose apparently the anisotropic synchrony convention. And that's how we can have the light from the stars on the earth by day four. Is that basically the point that they're trying to make? Yeah, that that's pretty much, pretty much the case. But, uh, like you said, we can measure the one way speed of light and, uh, the ASC actually, as I pointed out, goes back to Reichenbach, and mm -hmm. uh, it was based on uh, the technology that you had to use a two-way speed of light because of the other notion that you cannot uh, synchronize remote clocks, which we'll get into a little bit later. So you basically yeah, had to ha have a stationary single clock, send a light beam out, have it reflect from an object, comes back, and the only clock measurement this, they claim is uh, reliable, I guess, is the single clock you have at the origin. Mm -hmm. And so all you can measure is a round trip uh, speed of light. Yeah. And therefore, you don't know when it reflected. So as a matter of fact, that's to me, that's, that's always been a pretty uh, interesting thing. If they say you don't know when it reflected from the mirror, which means there really was no event that it, when it reflected from the mirror. I think I made that <laughs> point in one of the uh, other yeah. talks, right? So, yeah. I mean, are you going to deny that there was an actual event at which the photon bounced off the mirror and came back? But he's essentially saying that, uh, or Reichenbach, that you don't know. So you can say that the reading on the clock when it reflected was any time between the time you sent the light out and the time you received it. Right. And I seem to remember one comment being that Lyle, and maybe this is wrong, I'm not sure, but um, I think one commenter made the point that Lyle didn't appeal to Reichenbach at any point. And I think your point is not necessarily that Lyle appealed to Reichenbach. I think your point was the, you know, just kind of the objective fact that um, that the ASC thinking and the inability to measure the one rate, one way speed of light goes back to, you know, the science that was available when he was working on it. Right. And the point is that it, things have changed. Right. Yeah, that's, that is a major point. But the fact that Lyle, I don't know if, who, who said he didn't appeal to Reichenbach, uh, that would be an, a, a, a scholarly omission in my view. I, th I think maybe he did. Okay. But okay. Uh, I mean, that's where it comes from. I mean, the very gotcha. notation, the Epsilon uh, notation, the Reichenbach conven conventionality th thesis. Yeah, it goes back to Reichenbach. So... Uh, Okay, maybe we should go on to the, uh, I, I'm trying to make some examples here of conventionality. Yes. And this is just another example. Uh, you know, for example, the famous quote, a rose by any other, any other name would smell as sweet. So in different languages, and of course, languages are a convention within a group of people, correct? Right? Oh, yeah. So, oh, sure. so, yeah. uh, so in English, this is a rose, it's a rosa in Spanish and all these different spellings, and I'm not going to attempt to pronunciate them, pronounce them. Uh, the the Arabic that, one is quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It doesn't sound, it doesn't have that R sound, art of air to fe or whatever, right? But, uh, and, you know, that's why we have dictionaries, right? The dictionary is the sure. method of translating between the different conventions. And in, in mathematics, mm -hmm. with coordinate systems, you have the exact same issue. Right, which is an interesting point that perhaps I haven't emphasized. Uh, you have to know, and I think maybe I did mention this because I said in order to implement ASC, you have to know what the one-way speed of light is. Right, all, all the right. formulas for ASC are you incorporate one-way speed of light. So, uh, in <laughs> other words, to, to make the speed of light infinite, you have to know how to set your clocks according to the one-way speed of light. Right, right, <laughs> okay. which is. Which is puzzling if we can't, you know, if it's impossible right. to measure. Right, right, right. So the mathematics establishes the methodology for how to translate from ESC to ASC. Now, Got it. How, how do we know how to translate from one language to another? Because we're referring to an objective reality. Mm. Right? The rose is yeah. the result. That's the standard. So we have Huge to compare point. all the we have to we have to put, we have to compare all the coordinate systems to the objective reality. Now, 
I'm going to digress a little bit here and get a little historical slash technical commentary. Uh, when Gauss and Riemann, who are the two famous uh, developers of what is known as differential geometry, uh, uh, was studying things such as, well, it was Gauss, how to measure distances on the Earth, surface of the Earth, it's geodesy. The surface of the Earth is curved, so you can't use Euclidean geometry. So his concern was how do you measure absolute distances in independently of coordinates? And that's how you, yeah, you know, he had, you know, came up with differential geometry, and uh, that's the basis of how you determine the properties of a geometric space independent of coordinates. That was his issue, right? Because the distance from London, say, to uh, Liverpool, is independent of what map projection you use. Right. Right. So, okay. So let me go ahead and go to this little bit more uh, abstract representation. Hopefully, the, 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 what I mentioned about roses and dictionary, this is basically the same concept, except Minkowski space, upon which uh, a, uh, Lyle bases his ASC, is analogous to the rose. Maybe that's the best way to put it. And, okay. uh, and then I can represent the properties of Minkowski space in either ESC coordinates. And this, this arrow in, intends to make the point or represent that for a given point in Minkowski space, I can assign some numbers to it. Right? Okay. Got it. And yeah. the same, this, this for the, actually, I should have drawn it coming from the same point. So coming from the same point, uh, as a matter of fact, can I, I wonder if I should just go ahead and edit real time. Okay, <laughs> there so, you go, um, yeah. So the, coming from the same point, I'm going to get different numbers, but number one is the same point, right? It, which is, this corresponds to the rows. So there's, there, there's an infinitude of coordinate systems that you can use to describe uh, the geometry of Minkowski space, of just as there's an infinitude of coordinate systems for the Earth. To represent the Earth, for example, Mercator coordinates, uh, polar stereographic coordinates. There's, a, you know, I think I mentioned this in some talks. Just go pull out your Rand McNally atlas or whatever and look at the various, you know, when you're looking at the Antarctica, right? It's a, uh, you got a different projection, right? But to summarize, each of these coordinate systems are conventional, all right? just like the right. languages are conventional. So these correspond to different languages, but these different languages that describe the space, you're not altering the space in any way. Right. right. Now, uh, Lyle makes a gaffe, I'm just gonna be blunt and say that, in his uh, The Physics of Einstein, says that somehow ESC coordinates enforce symmetry on Minkowski space. Well, no, ESC coordinates do not enforce any symmetries on uh, Minkowski space in the same way that uh, Mercator coordinates do not ex uh, enforce mm. certain symmetries or polar stereographic enforces any symmetries. Those, those different projections are used just to uh, highlight certain aspects of the geometry, right? Different projections, as, as we know, for example, Mercator projection, uh, things that are further away from the equator get distorted. You know, Greenland looks gigantic. You know, the North Pole gets stretched out into a line and so on and so forth, right? So those distortions don't represent the, the symmetries of the Earth. So right. Einstein synchrony convention coordinates uh, do not enforce any symmetries, but they merely express the symmetries that are already there. Mm. And they are, in fact, the natural coordinates in the speed of light is isotropic. And I want to point out Minkowski space is isotropic speed of light. So uh, ASC, unfortunately, obscures the symmetries. And, of course, it cannot alter them because the symmetries are invariant. They're a property of Minkowski space irrespective of what coordinate system you use, which was exactly the problem that Gauss solved mathematically, which is now known as the uh, discipline or the, the subject called differential geometry. Uh, right.
Now, so what what's before we move on to the you know to your technical note there one sort of clarifying question so one of the reasons this came up is because um you know one of the commenters had a question about or a, an observation that that yeah we thought that we were saying that the speed of light would need to be necessarily isotropic in minkowski space but they said something to the effect of well um it, it doesn't seem necessary to me but that's actually a requirement that 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 Minkowski space has an assumption of isotropic uh, light speed. And you said, well, no, uh, that's wrong. Um, you actually can't have isotropic uh, or anisotropic uh, speed of light in Minkowski space pretty much by definition. And so as right. a lay person, the puzzling thing to me, and I'll let you expand on that, but the puzzling thing to me is, well, this model uses Minkowski space and it's literally called the anisotropic synchrony convention. Help me, right. help me understand. <laughs> Right. Well, that's what I've tried to do here is that uh, isotropic speed of light is a property of Minkowski space. It's a geometric property of uh, Minkowski space, and you can't alter it by changing coordinates. Right. So, right. so, so, it's, so it, you it, cannot it seems... have an, an anisotropic speed of light Minkowski space because essentially by definition, Minkowski right. space has anisotropic. Right. So it's, that's a logical contradiction. Now, that's I'll just chalk it up to the... Uh, commentator asking the question doesn't understand what Minkowski space is. Right. 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 So, yeah. You know. Right. And so this sort of provides a, a more, a little bit more definition around, and, and you know, we can't go into all of, Oh, well, what's, what's the actual definition of Minkowski space, but that's something you could look up on your own and, right. um, right. you know, and, and I, I guess another about. analogy I would make, I'm sorry, I'm speaking over you. Another analogy you could make is, uh, is uh, flatness a property of Euclidean space? Can can I make Euclidean space spherical via a coordinate mm. system? No, no, you can't. No, right. So, right yeah, no. right. Uh, Euclidean, the Euclidean plane that we studied in high school geometry is flat, flat. and uh, you can't. Later on, when you learn analytic geometry and start throwing Cartesian coordinates on it, you can't turn that Euclidean plane into a, a hyperbolic or a sphere or anything else. So a, a spherical Euclidean space is a uh, oxymoron. Got it. Okay. Okay. Right. Very good. So the, here's a technical note and those that uh, want to at least delve into it or, or thinking about going into mathematics or a creationist that wants to go into cosmology. Uh, this, this, all the, a lot of this stuff comes from out of the differential geometry developed by uh, Gauss and later Riemann, given a space in some sort of coordinate system, the question is, how do you determine the symmetries? Well, there's a set of, uh, there's a mathematical technique or method that you can discover the symmetries of a space irrespective of the coordinates. It's called the killing equations. And uh, that produces what's known as a killing vector field. And here's the link that your uh, readers can uh, go to to check that out. But I'll just give a quick summary here. I won't read the whole thing. Uh, but the uh, the highlighted section is that the uh, killing vector field generates the symmetry. Now generate doesn't mean it creates it. It means mathematically speaking. It's like solving an equation. All right. So I solve the equation and that equation generates or shows you how to determine the symmetries. And the main point is the killing vector will not distort distances on the object. Right, so I can go to ASC coordinates, uh, compute the uh, generators, and lo and behold, the generators are precisely uh, the uh, transformations of special relativity, which are known as rotation, translation, and boost. In other words, transforming from one inertial frame to another, you know, from velocity zero to velocity v. All right, so that's called that's called the Lorentz Poincaré transformation group. So, it, right. So that that's standard stuff. So let's see what else do we have here. Uh, yeah, this is just another. I'm going to leave it up for those that have the mathematical savvy to be able to decipher what I'm saying here. But. Uh, what I've drawn here is a line segment PQ, say in the Euclidean plane. And rather than using your standard Cartesian coordinates, you know, lines X, Y at right angles that we learned in analytic geometry, 
I basically distorted the coordinate system into a new coordinate system that measures V along these lines and measures U along these lines. They're just labels, they, they're not distances. So by using this uh, new coordinate mesh, I didn't change the length C of this Euclidean line segment, segment that goes from P to Q. Okay, mm -hmm. there's a lot of technicalities mm -hmm. that uh, I could go through, but ds squared here, which is a differential geometry term, uh, gives you the distance between P and Q if you do the appropriate mathematics. But you see the distance depends not just on U and V, these DUs and DVs, it depends upon these new quantities this G mu mu, G mu, uh, G uh, uv and GVV. And there's a technique for calculating those when you transform the coordinates. And you have to use this instead of x squared plus y squared if you were using uh, Euclidean coordinates. So anyway, the main point I'm trying to make here is you don't alter the length of geometric objects by changing coordinates. And that goes back to what I said on the previous slide. You cannot change the speed of light by altering coordinates. Okay, so that's, yep. that's yes. Okay, uh, so I'm just going to say it. Well, this is a little bit more detailed, less busy than the previous one, but uh, it's showing what I mentioned that if I have the distance ds between say a and b, and perhaps I should have left it as p and q, that I just measure dx as a distance, dy as a distance, and use the Pythagorean theorem, right? The uh, hypotenuse is uh, the square root of the sum of the squares of the opposite sides. For a right triangle but if i just say let's make some new weird coordinates u and v which by the way are no longer distance right because if i take the square root of a distance i don't have a distance right, right. If something's four feet away and i take the square root so i get two square root of feet for you right yeah to use the units and i get uh, if this is five i get the square root of five square root of feet for v you have to use a new formula here right but ds is going to be the same number so the point again coordinates or conventions cannot alter distances which are not conventional change of coordinates cannot alter the invariant the objective reality of ds and yeah uh, and i know there's probably some asking how many different ways can you say this and i think the point is i i don't know that there is a, enough different ways you can say it because this yes, is the right. the biggest issue that there is really. oh exactly this is what everybody's stuck on and they give lip service to it that you can't change distances because it's a convention and i think i mentioned to you previously that uh if you agree that going back to my slide on uh, one pound and uh, I mean, i'm sorry one kilogram and 2.2 .2 pounds i can't change the weight via right. convention so how can uh, changing coordinates uh, change the speed of light? Exactly. You're yes. Right. right. Yep. So it, that shoots the whole argument in the foot. In other words, when the, when they appeal to conventionality of units, they they think that support for ASC it actually is a defeater of ASC in my mind. If you if you think through all the uh, the issues. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Let's see. This is an interesting aspect. So the question is, uh, do we expect distances to change if we change coordinates? Well, I've beat the drum how many times now? The answer is no, right? And I believe one of your commentators, person making a comment, said something that we expect the distance to change if we change coordinates. Is that correct? Uh, am I quoting him properly? Do you have that at your fingertips there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 I do. Um, he, he made the point that um, that he thought that if you like, if you take, if, if you're working with Minkowski distance and you're pointing out that the result is different between isotropic and anisotropic models, he says, yes, that's expected because different coordinates will give different values. Yeah, okay, and we just beat the drum and said, no, that's not true. Uh, what I was referring to was not that uh, we get different distances, whether using, our, what he said, Minkowski distances. Well, that's the only distances we can use, right? You measure distances in Minkowski space using the Minkowski uh, distance formula. But the point I was making that caused the change in distances was in the Reichenbach convention, and here we have the case where he could claim that the reflection time was T prime rather than T, 
according to ESC. So this is the ESC reflection time. This is the ESC reflection time in Minkowski space. The point I was making was that the distance T to R is not the same as the distance T prime to R. Well, that's not the same thing as changing the coordinates of this point T and this point R. We're talking about two different line segments. Well, the fact that two different line segments have two different lengths is rather unremarkable, right? I, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So we yeah, agree. He, that, he he clarified on that that um, um, that uh, there were some times where it appears that you calculated because this slide is is from another talk an isotropic C value for calculations that were supposed to be in an anisotropic frame. He was referring to what you were doing with these triangle right, diagrams. Right. Right. Yes, and but to clarify that even, uh, I'm allowed to use the isotropic C if I'm using ESC. That right. would be one way of putting it, right? And of course, to right. beat the drum again, that's the true speed of light, right? The ESC right. speed of light, right? So I'm allowed to do that because if you want to say the, uh, as long as I'm consistent, right? If, if I use ESC coordinates and you see that's the appropriate value to be using, for ESC, right? The question is, can you use a uh, deny C in ASC? Okay. And right. uh, in, in, in the summarize here again, that was the whole point of Reichenbach. The question is, which are the simultaneous events? Is it this event along this clock that's simultaneous with the reflection or this point that's simultaneous right. with the reflection? Well, according to uh, Reichenbach, since you don't know, and I've already mentioned this, that means there was no time of reflection. It was all of them. Well, that's eternalism. Right, right. Right. Okay. So, mm. so if, if I stick in, uh, the, the ESC coordinate system, he's saying, well, I don't know which where it reflected from. So I'm free to say it reflected that this, that this T prime in the R reflection is si actually simultaneous in a in a real present or is it t and r that when it reflected it is in a real present well the the whole notion of this is eternalist there is no objective point of when it reflected so in other words right. they're using an they're using an argument from ignorance basically is, is the way to put it i guess uh right Yes. Okay, let's go back into a historical uh, context. Back when uh, GR was uh, uh, formulated by Einstein, uh, Painley, which who, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, uh, had a, a discussion with Einstein. And uh, that discussion, and I guess I can forgive Painley at the time because it was just uh, formulated and people were grappling with the issues, right? And not everybody was up to speed. But at the time, it's clear that Painley's grasp for relativistic physics was deficient. Uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, apparently Painley placed stress on mere coordinates. Here's what Painley had said. This is a translation from the French. It is pure imagination to claim to draw consequence, consequences of this nature from ds squared. Well, as we've just talked about, ds squared is the reality. But he, so he's saying basically that it's imaginary to draw consequences from ds squared. And Einstein wrote back to Painleaf and correctly pointed out that ds is in fact the objective content, not the coordinates. So I'm beating the drum again in historical context, but this is Albert Einstein. And of course, Lyle's book is The Physics of Einstein. And I'm going to point out Lyle agrees with Einstein, as do I, in all differential geometry uh, students and so on and so forth. So Einstein wrote back to Painleaf, only conclusions reached, and I emphasize this, after the elimination of coordinates. There you have it in a nutshell. So if we're yeah. talking about ASC or ESC, uh, what I've endeavored to do in some of my discussions is point out how to eliminate coordinates, or if you're using coordinates, to identify which coordinates are the invariant ds coordinates if you find what i'm saying can i mm -hmm. can i look at can i verify that in asc coordinates the dx is in fact a coordinate independent distance 
In other words, it's, it's not the coordinates that's defining the distance. I take the distance and I decide to label it DX, if you're following what I'm saying. It's, it's mm -hmm. which way do you put the cart or the horse? It's back to the standard. It's the length that is the standard. And I'm going to label that length DS. Okay. So uh, we have to eliminate coordinates. So it, it doesn't depend upon ASC. It really doesn't depend upon ESC. So only conclusions reached after the elimination of coordinates may pretend to an objective significance. The metrical interpretation of the quantity ds squared is not pure imagination, but the deep core of the theory itself. And here's That's a link. Important. Yes. That's so, really important. Yes, right. So Einstein clearly understood what Gauss was saying, what Riemann was saying, and all other mathematicians were saying. Okay, so as I said, Lyle agrees with Einstein. So do I. So this is a quote from uh, The Physics of Einstein. And this gets back to the issue uh, that where I was pointing out earlier, the you can't change the distance as long as we're talking about the same two events that anchor the endpoint of, of, a, of a line, you know, the, a, the PQ. Of course, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we can't talk about PQ than some other interval, A, B, and claim, well, look, they're different lengths. Well, they're different intervals. Right. So here's what here's what Lyle says. So Michael and Sarah, these are two imaginary participants, may disagree may disagree on the times and positions of any events in the universe, which are just coordinates, by the way. But they right. emphasis added, but they will always agree on the space time interval between <laughs> any two events. If I choose two different events, right, I'm going to get different distances. But we're talking about the same two events. And then Lyle says, this tells us something quite profound about the universe. The space-time interval is the real absolute quantity. Okay. Well, uh -huh. the, the speed of light in ASC doesn't use any real absolute quantities. It uses coordinates, right? And, and Einstein said you got to eliminate coordinates, right? Lyle failed to eliminate coordinates. He's, he's a matter of fact, he's totally... Uh, uh, beholden to coordinates to, and so was Reichenbach to get the uh, program going. And here's yeah, the page. And yeah, so just ahead. to be clear here, um, I mean, and, and again, we're not trying to be like, you know, mean or put down. That's not what this is about at all. After all, this is the winsome creationist podcast, but the, but the point we're trying to make, I mean, there's really no other way to say it, that this is just a logical contradiction, right? I mean, this Correct. is just, this is just Lyle contradicting himself. Right. Yeah. He hasn't thought accurate? through. Yeah, I would say so. He hasn't thought through all the issues and, uh, okay. right. so, but he does say this, which I find interesting later on on page, the very next page, relativity does have a, have absolute such as the speed of light in vacuum. Now I suppose AFC <laughs> advocates and even Lyle could say, well, what I meant by speed of light in vacuum was the two way speed of light, but he didn't say that there. Right. Right. Yeah. So, and the space time interval. Well, see, I'm claiming the space time interval is a property of Minkowski space. So I'm beating the drum yet again, right? That, uh, yeah. Right, and these are invariant absolute quantities, right? Okay. But Einstein said correctly, one must eliminate coordinates to write a physical conclusion. So I agree. And, and as I said, Lyle failed to do so. Mm. And that's what I've tried to point out in one of the previous talks was, you know, the, the R, the distance changed its meaning when you went to ASC. It was no longer, it was, still, it was a coordinate that changed its physical geometric meaning. It was no longer the distance to the reflector. Exactly. Uh, right. right. Providing that you're a presentist, but unfortunately, uh, uh, Lyle has an eternalist point of view which I hope someday he will uh, discard. Amen. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, let's move through. We've got probably about, I don't know, 10 ish more minutes. So uh, if we want to try to kind of speed through some of these last ones, we can, or we yeah, can take I, I our think, time. I think, I think we can. Uh, okay. Some people keep asking, can we keep distance clocks and synchronization synchronization? Well, the, the answer is yes. And this actually, because otherwise GPS would not work, period. And I'll show that in a later slide. And the second point is that the notion that among some that clocks cannot be synchronized would invalidate all the relativity. Mm. For example, everybody talks about time dilation, right? 
So yeah. if if a moving clock T prime runs slow by this reduced factor relative to a stationary clock, then that that's actually that depends upon the invariant interval. Then we know how to transform or compute and correct one clock that's moving, right? So all we have to do is if I have a moving clock relative to another one, and I want to know what the stationary clock reading is, I just divide by that factor, right? So I've, right. I've got that diagram over here. So I have a moving clock that moves from O to B. It measures this invariant length T prime, which Lyle agrees with. So, and right. then uh, it, 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 this is the time clicked on the stationary clock. Then uh, T is the length of OA, which is an invariant, and uh, T prime is the length of OB, which is an invariant. So uh, yes, yeah. we can synchronize them. Uh, so actually, so if if the speed of light depends upon synchronization, then uh, GPS wouldn't work, right? Uh, for example, I guess right. I got these out of order. Here, here's the uh, technical details of how GPS works, and everybody uses, I think, GPS every day on their smartphones, right? Mm -hmm. Your navigator, your car navigator, how many more miles do you have to go, and so on and so forth. So it basically needs to know the speed of light C because it's a one-way phenomenon, right? The satellites are transmitting their GPS signals to this ground station located at X0, Y0. And uh, we need to solve to find, if I have three satellites, say, uh, the common point of intersection. So I don't know what X0, Y0 is, but the satellites know where they are and they tell us when they transmitted and uh, based upon time of reception, we can compute the radii, these circles. And so that's what's going on in your cell phone. Yeah. Uh, so I, I won't go through all the details. Interestingly enough, you don't have to have your ground clock synchronized, which is very interesting. You could reset your cell phone's time wrongly, I guess, and, and not yeah. have it update, and you'll still get your right to position. There's a technique for doing that. It's known as time difference of arrival. So you take these differences between the and, and you don't need to know what your time is. You basically solve for it based upon the speed of light. So, and here's an example. Say, uh, according to ASC, we can make the speed of light any value we want from one half the speed of light to infinite. So I've enlarged it. So if the speed of light were larger, this would be a larger circle, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And so with this one, D1, D2, and D3 would be larger radii. And you notice what happens you're here and they don't intersect. So you don't know where you are. So I, right. I, I induced this as another example uh, why ASC is wrong. And the only answer is that because their C is not the real speed of light. Right, right, right. So, exactly. So, okay, all right. And here's another example. I'll try to get through these real quick. How about the New Horizons mission? This relates back to can we compute uh, synchronization? Uh, if you use the time dilation formula, which Lyle agrees with, uh, if you the calculation of the time dilation over the entire flight to Pluto was only about a half a second. Uh -huh. So, so the New Horizons had a atomic clock on it, or at least I, it was an atomic. It was a very highly stable clock. It had a accuracy of, you know, over years, uh, more many many years. You know, it, it ticks accurately. And uh, it was set, the, the, his clock was set to zero when they launched it. And it clicks and keeps track of seconds, it, which is called mission elapsed time. And so we can compute the time of transmission, the new horizon clock to the time of receipt on earth. And I wanna emphasize this again, time dilation only changed it. So we, we might have a half, even if I didn't correct the uh, new horizons clock by subtracting off or adding on a half second, a half a second relative to four and a half hours is nothing to talk about, right? Sure, so, of course, yeah. It, right, so we know it takes four and a half hours for the telemetry to download from the New Horizons from Pluto to the Earth, right? Huh. I mean, the, the clocks were essentially in sync up to within a half a second. Yeah. Right, so, yeah, it took, what, nine and a half years for the a probe to get to Pluto. In over nine and a half years at its speed, 
that's the only uh, time error. I'm that's not going to worry about it. I'm not going to worry cool. about a half second. Well, I mean, they can say, well, see, you couldn't synchronize it. It was a half second off. Well, I don't care. Right. If you believe time right. dilation. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is, I'm beating the horse yet again. Uh, can there be an anisotropic Minkowski space? Again, I've said over and over again, the intrinsic geometric property of Minkowski space at the speed of light is isotropic. And I've already said this. It's like yeah, asking, yeah. Can, a, can I make a, have a spherical Euclidean space? That's an oxymoron. And remember the objective space time interval ds in Minkowski space is this, where dx, dy, and dz are actually independent of coordinates, even though it is a coordinate label, it's the distance. And this interval is independent of coordinates. And so if I set dt equals zero, I get a G, I get Euclidean space, right? And I think I mentioned the fact that uh, if you take uh, ASC synchrony as the space of simultaneity, then you no longer have a Euclidean space, which means Euclidean geometry wouldn't work here. So, mm. all right. Mm. So... Uh, people always take some people seem to take issue with the fact that I, uh, you know, calling uh, Lyle an eternalist. I, I think he's uh, just hasn't thought it through. I don't think he probably is if he think isn't that he would remain one if he thought it through. But this this shows the uh, this is a quote, and more people should actually grab his book and read it if they're ASC advocates to see what Lyle himself says. Uh, I'll just read the emphasized text here. He says, nonetheless, hypothetically, if faster than light travel were possible, then time travel into where the past would also mm. be possible, right? Right. Yeah. Well, that's back to what I said in one of the previous talks, that time is not a place. The past exactly. is the past does not exist. So how can you travel to a place that does not exist? If you believe the past exists, then you're an eternalist. Right. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And time yeah, travel and is impossible and present. So this is Lyle himself and uh, in presentism, which we may have a session on the philosophy of eternalism yes. and presentism. Time is real and the past does not exist. OK, let's see. We're almost done. I think I got one more slide. Yeah, one more. Uh, yeah. Two, two, yeah. A couple of other uh, good questions were asked. So. Uh, this is, I guess, is a good paraphrase of, of the questions of one of the commentators. The question is, star yeah. displacement an issue, and what about time dilation? Uh, my claim is that uh, star displacement, which is essentially stars that find themselves at great distance out of galaxies at distances that would imply they're traveling greater than the speed of light. Uh, well, no, this is not a... Uh, not an issue because according to general relativity, and this gets into the issue that you mentioned, do we use special relativistic or general relativistic models? And mm -hmm. we need to use general relativity because at large scales of the universe, the predominant force at large scales is gravity, right? So it's right. the galaxies are attracting each other due to gravitational attraction. But according to general relativity, matter can actually travel faster than the special relativistic speed of light C. And uh, I've made the point many times that uh, the governing theory is general relativity, not special relativity. Special relativity is a special case. General relativity is the general case. So special relativity doesn't uh, dictate over or rule over general relativity. It's the other way around. Okay. So, and according to general relativity, galaxies can reach, according to the uh, extrapolation of the Big Bang solution, uh, 41 uh, giga light years in 14 uh, billion years. Well, you can see that that's three times the speed of light, right? If it was traveling at the speed of light, it would have only made it out to 14 giga light years. So, and, and as mm -hmm. a matter of fact, that's yeah. the present value, or actually this was the speed, what, uh, 500 million years after the purported Big Bang, it was traveling three times the speed of light. In fact, if we go back to uh, sooner than that uh, time after the Big Bang, uh, after what's called known as the initial singularity, the speed of matter in recession is nearly infinite. So the question, my point is yeah. that the only difference between the entire universe and the galaxy is just size. So if, if uh, galaxies 
can travel faster than the speed of light, so can stars within the galaxies. Right? There's yeah, GR yeah. doesn't brief, brief, uh, right. So, so in brief, star displacement is not, according to general relativity, is not a, not an issue. And then the next question is, does time dilation uh, solve the, the uh, problem? I claim no, because if we're going to be presentist, it says there's an actual now. Uh, the actual now that we're in is 7,000 to, you know, whatever uh, years. Uh, uh, the creation is, yeah, we're, creation is 7,000 years ago. We have to agree that everything in the universe is 7,000 years from the initial creation, that we're all in the same now. I guess it's right. called year, year, right? So we have to agree that the universe as a whole has an exact single age. Okay, so uh, time dilation. Uh, time dilation is a distinction between uh, the age of an object. So, for example, you know, in science fiction, for example, Interstellar, uh, yeah. where you go <laughs> off and and you're still young and your your daughter's about on her deathbed, right? That's an issue of age. I mean, they were both in the same present. They were always in the same present. It's just that motion mm -hmm. affects the rate at which you age. It's a good so, example. Right. Yeah. So, okay. So the notion of a, actually the notion of a single age of the universe also comports with general relativity. Since all clocks under influence of gravity alone tick at the same rate for the moment of creation. That's why they say the universe is 13.8, you know, a billion years old. Everything in the universe right. is 13.8 billion years old, right? So, yeah, yeah. That's so a I good, provide right. the, the link the to a very, between time and age. Right. So uh, yeah. So there clocks, physical clocks, can run slow uh, due to time time dilation. Right. Anyway, so I addressed this in a very another esoteric paper that I published in uh, Answers Research Journal for those that uh, have the savvy to be able to you know, digest it, or for aspiring. Uh, young earth creationists that want to uh go into cosmology Ho hopefully they can even if they don't understand it can read that and re uh, digest what they can understand and encourage them to go into a uh, advanced degree in uh, cosmology well uh that's a great that's a great point and a great place to end it um we need more right we need Correct. more yes. Dennis's, uh to, to to come up and um and and really think through some of these issues i mean especially your command over the mathematics and the physics of everything is just really incredible so the more people that can really think with a critical mind toward the sort of solutions that we're developing for some of these problems and as we develop the creation model more um, I think that's just going to matter more and more and more. So, yeah, if you're out there listening to this or you have, you know, you have kids that are really interested in science, uh, encourage them to actually go into some of these fields and to um, and to make a difference. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up here. I'm not sure exactly what we're going to go into next time, whether we're going to talk a little more general about um, general relativity versus special relativity and maybe get into the, some of the, the presentism versus eternalist stuff, or if we're going to dive into – uh, Phil's model. I'm not sure exactly which direction we're going next, but um, I'm sure it will be a, a joy whenever we get there. So, Phil, thanks for your time again. We really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Steve. I enjoyed the talks also, and I, I hope I adequately described the concepts and made certain points clearer, at least. It's, I, I do agree there's a whole can of worms of issues. I think I mentioned this before, involved in this notion of ASC it's, it's the coreness, the conventionality, uh, synchronizing clocks, simultaneity, uh, presentism, eternalism. And uh, hopefully the goal is to get those all untangled. And so go. that your viewers can suddenly start seeing the big picture and see how they're all related and how you have to converge on, uh, you know, a, a one given consistent uh, theological, philosophical, and mathematical scientific point of view amen yes that's the goal to be uh eminently consistent in everything that we do as christians and as creationists all right thanks again for your time phil and uh, we'll see you next time okay sounds good thanks steve